The young maiden reclines by the lakeside, shivering from the cold. Above her, a boy sits, tears streaming down his face, his countenance concealed by a half-mask, revealing only beautiful crimson eyes. Who is he, and why does he weep? The maiden loses consciousness. She awakens in an unfamiliar place, nestled in a luxurious bed. Attendants flutter about, tending to her needs and administering a peculiar elixir. She cannot recollect her identity nor discern her whereabouts, yet she maintains composure. Engaging in conversations with all, she poses thought-provoking inquiries. It dawns upon her that she has been transported into the realm of an adult novel titled The Monstrosity and the Young Lady. This novel revolves around a fair maiden named Diana and a monstrous prince named Blake. There is also Richard, a valiant hero who vies for Diana's affections, and Ancia, Diana's sister. It is within the body of Ancia that the maiden has found herself. Though at this juncture, Ancia is merely a ten-year-old child. Blake loved Diana, yet she chose Richard. Consequently, Ancia wedded Blake, becoming a princess. However, upon beholding his countenance, she recoiled in horror. Overwhelmed by terror, Ancia met her demise in the lake. Blake was devastated. Deeming himself a monster, he lived out his days in seclusion and despair. In the original novel, Ancia perishes. However, presently, she is alive, as the maiden has inhabited her physical form. Therefore, the weeping boy who stood by her is none other than Blake. If he weeps, it implies that he does not harbor hatred towards Ancia. Thus, it is imperative to engage in discourse with him. Ancia rises to her feet and embarks on a quest to find the prince. Within the novel, he was the character she adored the most, and presently, she has no intention of denying him. According to the plot, Ancia's mother died during childbirth, and her father, Count Belasian, remarried another woman. The new wife bore him Diana, leaving Ancia as an unloved child. Consequently, she was thrust into marriage. Thus, her leap into the lake stemmed not solely from the prince's appearance, but rather from sheer desperation. Ancia enters the prince's chambers. He sits upon the bed, facing away, wrapped in a blanket. Calling out to him, he shrieks, pleading for her not to draw near, fearing that she will recoil at his grotesque visage. Undeterred, Ancia approaches him resolutely and uncovers the blanket. Blake turns towards her. Ancia beholds a tearful boy of eight summers, wearing a half-mask. Blake does not resemble a monstrosity, but rather a darling rabbit. With determination, she removes the mask from his face, revealing only black marks, the remnants of a curse, yet nothing truly horrific. Taking the prince's face into her hands, Ancia proclaims that she has never beheld anyone more exquisite than him. Blake initially doubted Ancia. Then she declared that she accidentally fell into the lake, slipping, with no intention of taking her own life. She came to express her gratitude to the prince for saving her. These words moved the prince to tears. Ancia embraced him and confessed her affection for him. The prince responded by saying that he too had feelings for her. However, Ancia knew that he truly loved Diana. The emperor was aware of this as well. He attempted to negotiate with the countess, Diana's mother, and Ancia's stepmother. The countess refused to give up Diana, so Ancia took her place instead. Even though the prince desired Diana, because she had the power to break the curse that plagued him, the Belasians possessed the magic of light, and Diana possessed a great deal of it. Ancia possessed less, but it was still present. In theory, she could also free the prince from the curse. The curse upon Blake was not only manifested in the visible marks, it also inflicted intense pain upon him. The pain was particularly excruciating in the cold. Undoubtedly, it was unbearable for Blake to pull Ancia out of the pond. However, for the magic to work, physical contact was necessary. Therefore, Ancia had to touch Blake as often and closely as possible. Intimate contact would be most effective, but at their age, it was impossible. The prince even hesitated to suggest sleeping together, although Ancia merely wished to hold his hand in her sleep. Ancia took the prince's hands in her own, gazing into his eyes. In the novel, this was sufficient for Diana to ease Blake's pain. However, the prince showed no signs of relief. Perhaps Ancia's magic was insufficient. Ancia inquired once again if Blake would like to sleep together with her. Blake responded by asking if it would not be unpleasant for her. 
Ansia reiterated that it would not and that the curse upon the prince would be lifted when he turned 18. She recalled the founder of the empire, Emperor Philip. He was married to the goddess of light who bestowed upon him the power with which he built the empire. However, the emperor abandoned the goddess and fell in love with another. As a consequence, the goddess cursed his descendants. The curse consumes the prince from within. On the night of his 18th birthday, he will teeter on the edge of life and death. In the novel, Diana saved him from this fate, but here, it is up to Ansia to save him. The next morning, they woke up, holding hands. The prince smiled, and Ansia found his smile appealing. After a few days of living together, Ansia began to notice peculiarities in Blake's life. For instance, he disliked leaving his room. Moreover, he only consumed greens and vegetables, just like a true rabbit. However, in reality, the prince enjoyed meat, fish, and sweets. They were simply not provided to him. Blake is treated as if he is cursed. Hence, he is fed the same monotonous diet. Ansia decided to rectify this. She requested that a servant summon the prince's head chamberlain. Ansia received Brown, the prince's chamberlain, and the eldest son of the Marcus of Hamel, at her place. As a hereditary Marcus, he considered his status to be superior to Ansia's. Well, it's time to humble his arrogance. Ansia boldly stated that the prince's food was extremely meager. She accused Brown of squandering royal funds allocated for the prince's table. The head of the guards, Eden, immediately took it upon himself to escort Brown to the prison. Brown was taken aback by such treatment. He immediately began to shout, proclaiming his Marcus status and belittling Ansia as nothing more than the pitiful wife of an ugly prince. Ansia also demanded that he be charged with insulting the royal family. It was necessary to take further action. The girl who had taken up residence with Ansia was reading a novel. In it, Blake was stripped of his prince title after the death of his father, Emperor Tenstone. The throne was taken by his uncle and Richard's father, the Duke of Castle. Blake was exiled to the Southern Islands. At that time, some of the servants betrayed him, siding with Richard. Ansia demanded a list of the servants and dismissed those who were traitors in the novel. Among them was the head chef. So Ansia decided that she would now do the cooking herself, especially since she discovered a vast array of spices in the pantry that Brown hadn't been using in their meals. Without much thought, Ansia immediately prepared delicious rice, cutlets, and stew. The prince was astonished. Ansia claimed to have found the recipe in some book, even though she had actually cooked everything in her own world. Ansia must protect Blake. She cannot lift the curse. That task belongs to Diana but she can care for the prince until he meets Diana and prevent the emperor's death. He is currently in the Valley of Chaos. They must await his return. In the meantime, since the prince enjoys the food she prepares, it is necessary to create a proper oven and cooking pot. Ansia walked around the courtyard, searching for a place to install the oven. Suddenly, someone behind her asked what she was doing there. Ansia turned around and faced a tall and dignified red-eyed brunette in a uniform adorned with a dazzling blue cuffling, made of some precious gemstone. A scar was visible on his neck. It was Richard. Richard, the second son of the Duke of Cassilla and brother of the reigning emperor, was widely believed to be a contender for the throne. After all, Blake was cursed. However, Richard could not lay claim to the throne due to his mother's status as a slave. He felt ashamed of this fact and dreamed of becoming an emperor at any cost. He pursued his goal ruthlessly, disregarding any means necessary. In the novel, he manipulated Diana to eliminate Blake from his path, and he succeeded. On the other hand, Anzia is determined to do everything possible to prevent that from happening. Richard declared that she had acted insolently and rashly by dismissing the servants and imprisoning Brown. As Anzia had suspected, his spies were among the servants. Richard viewed her behavior as a response to his rejection of her affections. However, Anzia told him that she disliked him and doubted anyone could find him appealing in general. Richard couldn't believe his ears and almost reached out to grab Anzia's hand, but Blake intercepted his hand. Menacingly, he repeated Anzia's words about her disinterest in Richard. Anzia asked how he dared to offend the prince and princess. Blake also reminded Richard that Anzia was no longer Lady Belasian, but a princess. Humiliated, Richard apologized and left. Blake turned to Anzia and asked her not to look at anyone else but him. 
She promised, adding that Richard was not to her liking. Anzia decided to assist the prince in his baths. This would help dispel the rumors that anyone who touched the curse mark on the prince's skin would become cursed themselves. These rumors led to the prince being stripped of his title and exiled to the southern islands. In the meantime, Anzia assures the prince that his curse will not be transmitted to her. He can confide in her and trust her. Blake admits that he only likes Anzia and has no need for anyone else. In the bath, Anzia saw for the first time that the seal of the curse had spread across the entire left side of the prince's body. Despite his embarrassment, she found nothing repulsive about it. On the following morning, Anzia received a package, flowers, and a letter. It was from Richard. He expressed profuse apologies for what had transpired. However, Anzia had no intention of succumbing to his influence. She asked her maid, Melissa, to return everything, hoping it would dampen Richard's ardor. Yet in the following days, she was inundated with gifts and bouquets. Despite them, she continued to send everything back. However, soon thereafter, she would receive new offerings. Finally, Richard sent a treasure, a ring adorned with the breath of a mermaid, a magical stone infused with the energy of the sea. It was a unique gem. In the novel, Richard had presented it to Diana. Although Anzia was curious to behold it, she decided to refuse it. She requested that Richard be informed not to send anything further. She had no need for anything from him. Anzia ventured out for her first stroll in the city. She was accompanied by her maid, Melissa, and her bodyguard, Aiden. They arrived at the blacksmiths. Anzia commissioned a cauldron, providing him with detailed sketches from different angles for clarity. The blacksmith promised to fulfill the request. Anzia and her entourage then returned to the palace. In the palace, she was immediately greeted by a delighted Blake. He had missed her greatly and had been anxious during her absence. In doing so, she noticed a rather agitated state in the prince. His hands trembled. Blake confessed that he had feared Anzia would flee from him. Anzia pledged not to run away, yet she remarked that if the prince were to find another love interest, she would be prepared to fade into the shadows. However, the prince refused to entertain such a notion. He declared that he only needed Anzia. At that moment, a footman named Hans entered the hall and announced the return of Emperor Tenston. Additionally, Hans informed Anzia that the blacksmith awaited her. She accompanied him into the corridor. However, the footman confessed that they were not heading towards the blacksmith. The emperor himself personally summoned her. Yet, Anzia had already surmised this. Hans revealed that the emperor was furious about the dismissal of the servants. He wanted to protect her and even decided to take the blame upon himself. However, such an act would lead to his execution. Anzi advised him against it, suggesting that he stay with the prince while she resolved everything on her own. As she made her way to the audience, she pondered. Tenston was supposed to have sent the accursed son to the southern islands, yet he did not do so. Instead, he exiled him to a distant palace. Though the emperor pretended indifference towards his sole son, in reality, he loved him. Anzia could serve as a bridge between father and son. She merely needed to earn the emperor's favor. She entered the throne room. Before her sat a man of extraordinary beauty, clad in crimson attire trimmed with white fur, adorned with gleaming orders on a pristine sash. Anzia introduced herself. The emperor's first question was why the chamberlain had been sent to prison. Anzia explained that he had appropriated the prince's dining budget for himself. The Marcus Himmel, who was present in the hall, shouted that it was a lie. However, Anzia had the treasury book with her, where all incomes and expenses were recorded. Greenery was sent to the prince, while the chamberlain indulged in juicy steaks. Moreover, Brown had been embezzling funds from the palace treasury and squandering them in gambling. The emperor believed Anzia and silenced the protesting Marcus. However, passions were escalating in the hall. The emperor noticed that Hamel was making a threatening gesture and immediately approached him with a drawn blade. Meanwhile, the emperor's footman, Colin, offered Anzia to leave the hall. She knew she could trust him, so she departed and entrusted him with the magical sphere. It bore all the words spoken by Brown regarding the prince and princess. As a result, Hamel had his hand severed for attempting to strike the princess, while Brown had his tongue severed for embezzlement. Both were sentenced to thirty years in prison and stripped of their family titles. However, Anzia was not summoned for an audience again. 
Therefore, she decided to go to the palace on her own. She ordered a carriage to be prepared, but as soon as she set foot on the carriage step, Blake approached her. He requested to accompany her, and Anzia agreed. After all, the emperor loved his son. He would not be able to refuse them. The emperor concluded his affairs, so Anzia and Blake went straight to his chamber. A guard attempted to bar their entry, but Anzia exclaimed indignantly that he dared not lay a hand on the princess. The guard could not resist. Upon entering the chamber, Anzia beheld the emperor. He had just emerged from a bath, so he was clad only in a towel. The body of Anzia's soul was astonished by his muscles and sculpted abdomen. It so confounded her that she initially did not hear the emperor's question. When she finally realized he was inquiring about their purpose, she inadvertently blurted out that the emperor was exceedingly attractive. An awkward silence ensued. Anzia attempted to justify herself by claiming she had never seen a man's unclothed body before, but it only made matters worse. Tinston donned a robe and stated that they could not have a conversation. He dismissed them, promising to summon them later. In the palace, Blake appeared despondent. He entered a room with his faithful companion, Eden. There, he asked Eden to undress to the waist. Naturally, the prince's bodyguard possessed a well-toned physique. Blake expressed his desire to look the same. He remembered Anzia laughing at his belly and remarking that she had never seen a man's body, even though she had seen his body, which was also masculine. It seemed that the issue lay with muscles. Thus, Blake resolved firmly to build up his physique. The emperor sat in his study with his personal spy, Yunnan, kneeling before him. In Tenstan's absence, Yunnan had been observing Blake and Anzia. Now the emperor wished to ascertain if he could trust her. He had witnessed his son's positive transformation yesterday. Yunnan confirmed that Anzia was a good person. She had impressed him. This made an impression on the emperor. Meanwhile, Anzia received a cauldron and prepared to cook a substantial meal. She called upon everyone to assist her, including Blake, who volunteered. In the morning, Collins arrived at Blake's palace with his entourage and presented Anzia with an official invitation from the emperor. Moreover, he delivered a multitude of gifts, all intended for Anzia. Adorned and with a beautiful hairstyle, Anzia set off for the imperial palace. The emperor was savoring tea in a spacious pavilion adorned with a fountain. Anzia greeted him, and he invited her to sit at the table. Anzia gracefully took her seat and expressed her gratitude for the gifts. The emperor inquired about her level of interest in Blake. Anzia replied that she was greatly enamored with him. Tinston clarified that many did not share the same sentiment towards Blake. Nonetheless, Anzia proclaimed that the emperor still loved him regardless, as he was his son. The emperor's benevolence was evident as he offered Anzia a variety of confections. When she mentioned that Prince Blake would also enjoy them, the emperor granted permission for her to bring them to the palace. Later, Tenston inquired about Anzia's knowledge of Eastern cuisine recipes. Anzia decided to reveal her polyglot abilities, explaining that she had perused books written in various languages. In doing so, she inadvertently referred to the emperor as her father. He was taken aback. But Anzia's statement was not unfounded since she was soon to be his daughter-in-law. The emperor agreed and encouraged her to seek his assistance whenever needed. With that, the tea ceremony concluded. After the tea ceremony, Anzia prepared a meal for the prince. It consisted of a spicy dish with soy sauce and egg rolls filled with mushrooms. Everyone relished the food, leaving no trace behind. Watching them closely, Yum Han whispered to himself that today, Anzia had once again demonstrated restraint. Yum Han was the emperor's shadow, entrusted with carrying out his clandestine orders. He never allowed any mistakes. However, this food, it enticed him. He yearned to taste it. Thus, while no one was around, he approached the stove and opened the pot. At that moment, footsteps echoed behind him. Yum Han realized it was time to hide. Anzia was taken aback when she discovered the pot was left open, with a beautiful black kitten sitting nearby. Anzia surmised that the kitten had nudged the lid. She felt compelled to feed it, as it looked at the pot with longing eyes. Anzia decided to share some of the spicy dish, enamored by the kitten and deciding to keep it as her own. She initially thought it was a she-cat, but Blake, who had approached at that moment, informed her it was a tomcat. Anzia decided to verify this, but the kitten scratched her and ran away. 
It was Young Hen who had transformed into the kitten, and Zia headed towards the palace, eager to offer the emperor a taste of the spicy dish. Tenston appreciatively evaluated the extraordinary flavors of the dish and expressed no objection to Anzia cooking it more frequently. He welcomed her to visit him more often. After a long day, Anzia lay in bed, resting. She reminisced about the admirable kitten. Suddenly, Blake jumped onto her bed, looked into her eyes intently, and uttered a gentle meow. Richard perused the reports from the palace. And Z had managed to gain the Emperor's favor in just a week, something he had been unable to accomplish for many years. The Emperor remained closed off to him. How had Anzia succeeded in this endeavor? Now she held a special allure for Richard. He desired to possess her. Richard's father was displeased with this development. Anzia was favored, while his own son was not. It is rumored that the Emperor will attend the Luminara Ball with Anzia. The Luminara Ball is a momentous event held to commemorate the closing of the Gates of Darkness. It gathers the entire cream of society and ambassadors from all nations. If the Emperor attends the ball with the Princess, her social standing will greatly improve, as will Blake's position. Richard could not allow this to happen. He decided to manipulate Anzia's emotions regarding her father. Anzia had a tumultuous relationship with her father. He humiliated her and did not believe in her abilities. He explicitly told her that she belonged to a lowly lineage and was deserving of death. The girl who found herself in Anzia's body witnessed all of this in her dreams. Anzia's father, Count Belasian, had also heard of her success at court. He couldn't comprehend why she hadn't contacted him all this time. What ingratitude! After all, it was thanks to him that she became a princess. One evening, Duke Castle paid him a visit. In a hypocritically polite conversation, he insinuated that Anzia had forgotten about her father upon entering the palace. And then he made a specific proposal. He asked for Diana's hand in marriage for his son, Richard. This proposition shocked Belasian. The girl within Anzia's body recalled her dreams. They were memories of the real Anzia. In them, her father constantly belittled and demeaned her. At that moment, Melissa entered and informed her that her father had arrived. Anzia instructed to have him kept in the waiting room. An hour later, Anzia went to meet her father, accompanied by Melissa and Aiden. She coldly inquired about the reason for his visit. He seethed with anger and demanded to be properly greeted. Melissa reminded him to show more courtesy towards the princess. Unable to contain himself, he cursed at Melissa. Anzia asserted that such behavior was unbecoming of a princess's father, and if he had come to create a scene, he should leave. The count began to verbally attack Anzia, even raising his hand to strike her. But Anzia reminded him fate of the Hamilovs. The Count comprehended that Anzia had undergone a metamorphosis, rendering their previous conversations futile. He attempted to beseech forgiveness with obsequiousness. However, Anzia demanded his departure and cautioned that she would never grant him forgiveness again. The Count was escorted out of the palace by guards, their arms linked. Subsequently, Anzia's father continued to dispatch letters to her, yet she refrained from perusing them. She busied herself with preparations for the grand ball, diligently acquiring manners and honing her dance skills. The art of dance proved particularly arduous for her. Despite her ceaseless training from dawn till dusk, it yielded no fruit. After each session, she lamented to young Han in feline guise that her efforts amounted to naught. On one occasion during this endeavor, Blake stumbled upon her. Initially, he harbored jealousy towards the cat, deeming himself the sole endearing entity to her. However, Anzi entreated him to dance with her. She yearned for him to be her inaugural dance partner. Blake acquiesced to her proposal for a dance. He was undeterred by the prospect of her inadvertently stepping on his foot. Furthermore, Anzia possessed remarkable lightness. They danced for a while, but soon Anzia began to falter and tread upon her partner's feet. She felt ashamed and awkward, yet the prince consoled her, advising her to relax and not fixate on their feet. They continued to dance, and then some more. They danced until late evening, until Anzia had mastered the dance perfectly. As a parting remark, Blake declared that everyone would be in awe of Anzia at the ball. He too wished to attend. Anzia promised that when he grew older, he would also partake in such grand soirees. The following morning, Anzia prepared rice with meat once again and served it to the emperor. 
Touched by his daughter-in-law's trust, he assured her that even if she were to poison the food, he would still consume it. Anzia implored him not to speak that way, as Tenchtun's death would deeply affect Blake. The emperor was pleased that his son did not despise him. As a token of gratitude for the delectable meal, the emperor vowed to erect a glass conservatory in the Amoria castle for Anzia. Amoria, such is the name of the distant castle where Prince Blake resides. It once housed a luxurious garden, but now lies abandoned. Tenchton decided to drain the lake, in which Anzia had contemplated drowning herself, and construct a conservatory in its place. When Anzia shared this news with the prince, he was elated. Like his father, he held no fondness for that lake. The conservatory was to be grand in scale. Anzia resolved to cultivate nutritious and exotic vegetables within its walls, such as cabbage. Meanwhile, Blake desired to grow roses, intending to bestow them upon Anzia as gifts. The following morning, Anzia departed early, and Blake bid her farewell with a warm smile. He rejoiced in her happiness. The preparations for the ball took a long time, but she emerged as a true confection. Adorned in a resplendent pink dress, embellished with flowers, ruffles, and boughs, her beauty struck the emperor himself, whom she deemed perfect. They stood at the entrance of the main hall. Tenchton took Anzia by the hand, and together they entered amidst the gathering. The emperor and the princess were introduced together, and then separately. All those gathered respectfully bowed. Amidst the crowd, Anzia caught sight of Richard. He wore a self-satisfied smile. Anzia involuntarily grimaced. The emperor noticed this and inquired if everything was all right. She whispered in response that he was the most handsome here. Tenchton smiled, causing a stir in the hall. His smile had not been seen by anyone in a long time. The seal ceremony commenced. Tenchton was presented with a golden goblet. He took it in his hand and began delivering his speech. Meanwhile, Anzia pondered that after the speech, he would have to dance with her. Yet, she desired to present the first dance to Blake. However, it would be improper to express this directly. Nevertheless, the emperor himself inferred her thoughts. He declined the dance, citing his lack of skill. Anzi was grateful to him. Everyone around discussed their endearing rapport. They all vied for attention before the princess and sought introductions. Anzi's charm captivated both the emperor and the courtiers. Furthermore, the princess had taken the trouble to learn the names of all the nobles and showcased her knowledge. Her father and Diana were also present at the ball. The girl smiled carefree. It seemed that all was well with her. Suddenly, Richard approached Anzia and offered to dance the first dance with him. Anger engulfed Anzia. How dare he? The first dance is meant for the prince, and everyone knows it. Anzia declined. Richard presumed it was because she couldn't dance and offered to lead. That's when Anzia asked if he was handsome enough to replace the emperor in the dance. The courtiers barely held back their laughter. Richard felt wounded and left. Anzia grew weary of the company and stepped out onto the balcony. She had left Blake for so long for the first time and already missed him. Suddenly, a knock came from the direction of the hall. Someone sought permission to enter. Anzia invited them in. Diana stepped onto the balcony. She wore a green dress and shoes, and emerald earrings sparkled in her fair hair. She warmly smiled at her sister and remarked that she looked especially beautiful today. Diana had always admired Anzia, and Anzia favored Diana. However, their father disapproved of their bond. Therefore, he would beat Anzia every time he found the sisters together. As a result, Anzia eventually ceased communicating with her. Diana later blamed herself for her sister's death. She left her father's house at the age of 18 and became Blake's maid to atone for her guilt. This is what brought Diana and Blake closer, but now everything was different. Anzi hadn't died, and Diana was happy. Casting a furtive glance around, Diana extended a square case to Anzia. Inside it was a stone imbued with the magic of fire. It warmed its owner in any frost. Diana secretly purchased it with her own money, unbeknownst to their father. Anzia gratefully accepted the stone. She was quite fond of Diana. By evening, Anzia returned to the palace. Blake was already waiting for her. He remarked that Anzia looked stunning. Finally, she could rest. Anzia confided in Blake that she did not dance with the emperor because she wanted the first dance from the prince. 
Blake revealed that he would not be able to attend the balls due to a curse upon him. However, Anzia promised that the curse would be lifted, yet the prince was afraid. He feared that Anzia would leave him. He demanded that she promise not to go anywhere. Anzia made the promise but understood that she would soon have to make way for Diana. Only Diana could free the prince from the curse. Therefore, Anzia decided to introduce them. She secretly invited her sister to the palace. She simply informed Blake of the situation. He dressed up and aimed to leave a good impression. Early in the morning, Diana arrived in a blue dress and shoes. She rushed into Anzia's embrace straight from the carriage. Then she introduced herself to the prince. Under the pretense of a meeting with the emperor, Anzia left them alone, instructing the prince to show Diana around the palace. Anzia sat in the library, contemplating Blake and Diana. Would they fall in love with each other? If so, Anzia could divorce Blake, and Diana would become his wife. At that moment, a pang of jealousy struck Anzia. Was Diana the only one capable of breaking the curse? After all, Anzia also possessed the magic of light. She simply needed to learn to control it. After some time, Anzia returned to the palace. She heard arguing from within. Upon entering, Anzia discovered that Blake and Diana were quarreling. She intervened and asked what had happened. It turned out they were debating who loved Anzia more, but at least they had become friends. Two years passed. The friendship between Blake and Diana had only grown stronger. However, it seemed that it was not destined to become romantic. Blake and Diana remained good friends, and this prevented them from becoming lovers. Anzi admitted to herself that she was content with this arrangement. She no longer wished to leave the prince. She enjoyed being in the palace so much. She adored the prince rabbit and the sister puppy. She hoped that the curse could be lifted without her departure. Over the course of two years, Anzia attempted to convey the possibility of lifting the curse. All that was needed was a maiden with the power of light, whom the prince would marry. However, she was not believed. Blake had no desire to marry anyone else. He only wanted Anzia, and he cared not for the curse. The lake was drained, a greenhouse was built. They built a training hall and a garden. New trusted servants were recruited to whom Anzia could entrust her affairs. Anzi received her own palace and a personal study on the third floor of the Imperial Palace. It was an extraordinary floor. It housed numerous books on the magic of light and darkness, ancient manuscripts, treatises on curses. This study was assigned to her so that she could seek a means to lift the curse from the prince. Once, this land was known as Zelkin. It was destroyed by Philip, who established his empire and the language of Zelkin was forgotten. No one could decipher the ancient books. In the novel, Richard claimed that he managed to read these books. Supposedly, they contained information about transferring the curse onto another person through ancient magic. Tinston would decide to bear the curse himself, but he would simply be killed. Now, Anzia must ensure that this does not come to pass. During the construction of the orangery, they discovered an ancient stone inscribed with symbols. The text was poorly preserved, but Anzia will attempt to decipher it. Her study is securely hidden, and no one will penetrate it. The key is to ensure that Richard remains unaware of her plans. He will undoubtedly be devising the same plan as in the novel, and Anzia has an advantage. She knows that plan. Diana spent a considerable amount of time on the training grounds, engaging in swordplay with Blake. She aspired to become a knight, to grow strong, and to be able to protect her sister. Blake shared the same desire. They even formed a chivalric alliance, crossing their swords and swearing to defend Anzia at all costs. The prince's curse showed no signs of progression, much to Anzia's delight. She cared for the prince as if he were her own little brother. However, he disliked being treated like a child. He yearned to grow, only noting that he was shorter than Richard. Anzia assured the prince that he would indeed grow taller. Diana continued her training both on the grounds and at home. It was during one of these sessions that her father discovered her. He was furious. His reputation had been tarnished. Now, all that remained was to secure a successful marriage for Diana. He intended to marry her off to Richard and then assist him in ascending to power. However, Richard would not marry a knight. Her father forbade Diana from further training, but he desired to know the happenings within the palace. Diana did not divulge much information. 
Consequently, her father requested that she leave a recording sphere in the palace. However, Diana was unable to fulfill his request. She lied, claiming that the sphere was faulty. Moreover, she declared that she would not marry and instead pursue her studies at the Knight Academy, vowing to protect her sister. Her father flew into a rage and thrashed Diana's legs with a cane. Following the incident, he demanded once again that the sphere be installed in the palace. If Diana failed to comply, he threatened to marry her off to the son of Count Conwell. It was the middle of November, and the first snowfall had arrived. Anzia noticed that Diana seemed downcast. However, when asked, Diana reassured her that everything was fine and resumed playing with the prince. They went outside and engaged in a playful snowball fight. Anzia initially observed them from the window, but soon joined in as well. Upon their return to the palace, Anzia suggested that Diana change out of her wet dress and dry herself. Diana hesitated to comply. Yet, during their playtime, Anzia had noticed Diana's discomfort in her legs. She called for a candid conversation, and Diana revealed everything. Anzia inquired why she hadn't spoken up earlier. Diana confessed her fear that Anzia harbored resentment towards her. Anzia reassured her that she did not hold any such feelings. Diana remained in the palace. Night fell, and she went to sleep in one of the rooms. Anzia sat by her side, gazing at her weary legs. The challenges Diana had endured were immense. Prince Blake arrived, but Anzia informed him that she would be sleeping with Diana. The prince understood and accepted the situation without disappointment. Late at night, Count Belasian attempted to enter the palace, but Hans refused him entry. He had received orders from the prince. However, the count persisted, and Hans was prepared to remove him by force. Just then, Blake appeared. Learning about the commotion, he decided to escort the count to the orangery. In the orangery, gathered around a tea table, the prince announced that Diana would be residing in his palace. The count began to explain why such an arrangement should not occur. A father should be with his daughter. Yes, he had raised Anzia with strictness, but it was all for her sake. Yet, she failed to understand this. It was not acceptable for Anzia to reject her father. Otherwise, how would she live once Blake succumbed to the curse? Interrupting these words, Blake declared that he had no intention of dying. Blake inquired if the Count was aware of the curse being transmitted through touch. The Count dismissed it as mere rumors. At that moment, the Prince seized his left hand with his own, and the Count experienced excruciating pain. Startled, he leaped up and hurriedly fled the palace. The Prince shouted after him, demanding that he never return. Once Anzia confirmed that Diana was fast asleep, she approached the Prince. He was sitting on the bed, pale but smiling. He mentioned having had a restless night and taking a walk in the orangery, where he plucked a beautiful rose. He extended the rose to Anzia. Suddenly, he collapsed. Anzia intended to seek help, but Blake asked her to stay with him. They then fell into a deep slumber for the entire night. Anzia woke up from a nightmare. She and Blake were lying on the bed, holding each other's hands. The prince had remained awake and was smiling at her. They embraced, blissful. The Emperor sent Count Belasian to a western island near the Valley of Chaos. He assigned him the task of protecting the island. However, everyone understood that it was an exile, and no one sympathized with the Count. Diana remained in the palace and prepared to enter the Knight Academy. Anzi supported her in every way. Thanks to her and diligent training, Diana passed the exams with high marks. The only thing that saddened her was the prospect of being without her sister at the academy. However, she promised to return in six years, and Zia realized that during that time, she must lift the curse from the prince. If she failed, she would leave. The new year arrived. In the novel, it was during this year that Tenson dies and Richard ascends to the throne. But that would not happen because she would be by their side. At the New Year's Ball, Richard caught sight of Diana for the first time. They had a disagreement. Diana defended Anzia against Richard's attacks. She was nothing like the character in the novel, and Anzia reveled in that fact. The New Year's Ball continued. Anzia suggested to the Emperor that they have a drink on the balcony. They stepped outside. The balcony offered a magnificent view of the entire Imperial Palace. Tenson recalled that Blake had a great fondness for this balcony. So, Anzia requested, as a New Year's gift, to visit Blake in his palace. The Emperor pondered. Anzia encouraged him. 
She stated firmly that she would certainly lift the curse. She emphasized that it was not transmitted through touch like a contagion. Furthermore, she requested him to be cautious with the castle family, especially Richard. The emperor promised to exercise caution. Time passed. Blake and Anzia bid farewell to Diana as she set off for the Knight Academy. Her education would span a lengthy six years, but Diana promised to visit them during the holidays. Anzia volunteered to accompany her on the journey to the Academy. They bid farewell to Blake, boarded the carriage, and departed. In the carriage, Diana handed her sister a red velvet chest. Inside it lay the key to the Belasian estate. Their father was getting a divorce, and the key was given to Diana. However, she passed it on to Anzia because a significant portion of the property rightfully belonged to Anzia's mother. It was rightfully hers. Finally, they arrived at the school. It was an immense palace with a red-tiled roof. Beautiful banners hung from its exterior. At the entrance, an honor guard stood in full ceremonial dress. They greeted the princess. Anzia was escorted to the balcony. Below, on the parade ground, a solemn procession of knights marched to the sound of trumpets. They led Diana and other recruits. It was the initiation ceremony for the knight apprentices. After the ceremony, Diana had to proceed. The sisters bid each other farewell. Anzia returned to the palace. In the palace, she presented the recording of the ceremony to the prince. Both of them marveled at Diana's resplendent appearance in her uniform and Aiden displayed the spheres on which Anzia herself was recorded. It turns out that this was requested by the Emperor. He gifted these spheres to Blake. Anzia held the key to the Belasian estate in her hands, reminiscing. It was an ancient lineage, descending from Rontel Belasian, the great mage of light. Together with Philip, he founded the Empire. When the Goddess of Light reclaimed her magic, Rontel's power began to wane. His descendants inherited but a meager fraction of that power. Yet this is a tale of their family history. Surely, there must be books on the magic of light in the mansion. Anzia resolved to pay it a visit. She arrived there by carriage, accompanied by the faithful Melissa. Immediately, she made her way to the library. While there were several books on magic, it was evident that they had not been utilized. Thus, Anzia decided to search for any documents in the Count's private study. However, she found only jewels and paintings. They had to leave empty-handed. During the journey, heavy memories overwhelmed Anzia. She felt so unwell that the carriage had to be stopped, and she stepped out to breathe in the air. When she started feeling better and was about to continue the journey, she suddenly spotted a solitary figure near a pink bush nearby. It was Richard. Richard's mother was a slave. She was seduced by Duke Castle. At first, Richard was treated as the son of a slave, but he was intelligent and excelled in his studies. Castle realized that he could make a good match out of him. He acknowledged Richard as his son and bestowed upon him the title of Duke. However, his attitude toward Richard's mother remained unchanged. When she fell ill with the plague, the Duke simply killed her, and Richard was locked up in quarantine in a warehouse. He was released only after they confirmed that he was not infected. Richard immediately went to the library to learn what the plague was. He realized that his mother did not have any plague. It was just that no one wanted to deal with a slave. That's when Richard swore to exact revenge on the Duke's family. He would strip them of everything and kill them, and he would become the Emperor. And now Richard stood near the pink bush. Anzia approached closer and greeted him. She noticed the beauty of the roses. Richard replied that his mother's grave was located there. Anzia tied a scarf to a branch. It was a funeral custom of the Lum people, to whom Richard's mother belonged. Richard warned her about the plague, but Anzi stated that the disease was eradicated along with the Lum people. Suddenly, Richard seized her hand and exclaimed that she did not comprehend the full extent of the danger. But Anzia broke free and declared that Richard's manner of communication was unbecoming. She also observed that Richard was intelligent and talented, and he should harness these qualities for the greater good. Then she returned to the carriage and headed for the palace. Richard, on the other hand, was pleased that Anzia had taken notice of his mother's grave. Anzia diligently pursued her studies. The emperor summoned the finest tutors of the empire for her. She shared the knowledge she acquired with Blake. For instance, she learned about the war between two emperors, Philip and Laxula, the emperor of the ancient land of Jelkin. Laxula set fire to Philip's palace, 
As Anzia recounted this to Blake, an authoritative female voice abruptly resonated in her mind. It demanded to be heard and inquired how dare they set the palace ablaze. Shocked, Anzia chose not to disclose the incident to Blake. She continued with the history lesson. Philip escaped from the palace, while Laxula, in his fury, destroyed all the Jelkanese books. Suddenly, Anzia noticed that Blake grew despondent and rubbed his left hand. She inquired about what had happened, but the prince assured her that everything was fine. However, Anzia knew that he had experienced a bout of pain, and that was concerning. Therefore, Anzia suggested taking a break from studying and training, and proposed they rest together. While Blake slept, Anzia kept watch. His temperature remained normal, and the pallor on his face had disappeared. When the prince awoke, he was in good health. However, Anzia observed that lately he had been experiencing bouts of illness frequently. Hence, she kept a close eye on him. A new day dawned, and Anzia prepared tofu. Everyone enjoyed it. She decided to deliver some to the emperor. Suddenly, she spotted a black cat. She was delighted, as she hadn't seen it in a while. Just then, Blake approached, took the cat into his arms, and declared that he would care for it. Anzi departed. The prince gazed at the cat and inquired about its identity. He immediately realized that it was not an ordinary cat. He understood that the cat was keeping watch over them, and now he longed to behold its true form. The scent of the cat reminded Blake of the fragrance of a particular individual. When the prince still resided in the imperial palace and felt unwell, someone dressed in black would come to him, and immediately the prince would feel relieved. He emanated the essence of deep, dark water, and the cat now exuded the same scent. Yunhang realized that there was no longer any point in hiding. He transformed into a human, greeted the prince, and introduced himself. He stated that he was the emperor's servant, assigned to watch over them by his command, and the emperor had also sent him to Blake. Yunhang also shared that he hailed from the east, yearning for his homeland's cuisine, and could not resist the temptation to try it. That's when he was nearly exposed. He had to resort to becoming a cat. Blake promised not to divulge Yunhang's slip-up to the emperor. The prince was grateful to him. However, he cautioned Yunhang never to approach Anzia again. Otherwise, he would not be forgiven. Anzia brought tofu to the emperor, who greatly enjoyed it. She mentioned that the prince himself had cleaned the soybeans for the tofu. The emperor was surprised. Anzia then remarked that he would have witnessed it with his own eyes if he had visited their palace. The emperor remained silent. Tenson relished the food. He declared his willingness to fulfill any request from Anzia in return. It was then that Anzia asked to be escorted to the Talarn Palace. It was the last palace of the Jelkan Empire and the first palace of the Philippian Empire. It was destroyed by the last emperor of Jelkan, and along with it, the entire capital of the Jelkan Empire. Since then, these lands have become forbidden. But Anzia wanted to find clues about the inscriptions on the stone slabs there. She had a vision of a burning palace, with stone slabs bearing writings within. Therefore, the solution must lie there. However, the emperor disagreed. There was a belief that if anyone set foot on those lands, a curse would befall them. And if it were the emperor, the curse would befall the entire empire. It was forbidden to go there. Moreover, the emperor feared for Anzia's safety. Even if she believed she could find the key to lifting the curse, Anzia requested to go there only once. She would protect herself with magic. Reluctantly, the emperor agreed but only once. When Anzia departed, he summoned Yunhing and asked him to accompany Anzia to the Talarn Palace. The day had come. Anzia was preparing herself for the Palace of Talarn. She resolved not to utter a word to the prince, lest he oppose her intentions. Instead, she stated that she would retire to ready herself for the grand ball to be held at the palace. Upon arriving at the palace, she made her way to a secret chamber on the third floor. However, the emperor was not alone. Yunhen accompanied him. The emperor proceeded to introduce him, and Anzia recalled that in the novel, the prince of the eastern land of Chan bore the same name. He had fled his homeland because he was to be executed for being chosen by a mysterious black dragon. Tenseth found him wounded, healed him, and offered him refuge. In gratitude, he became the emperor's shadow and guardian of Blake. Of course, Anzi did not reveal her knowledge of who Yunhen truly was. 
she also remained oblivious to the fact that he had been a cat. The emperor introduced him once again, then produced a black box, claiming it to be a gift for Anzia, one that would ensure her safety. Inside the box lay a pendant adorned with a large blue crystal, encircled by pearls, suspended from a golden chain. Tenseth explained that it was a purifying amulet crafted in the temple, known to provide protection against dark magic. Yunhan transported them to the palace of Telarn using his magical abilities. Anzi took hold of Yunhan's hand, closed her eyes, and in an instant, they found themselves at their destination. Dark clouds perpetually loomed over the accursed lands. Fiery red hues seeped through the veil. The earth appeared desolate. Before Anzia stood a gloomy palace, the Palace of Telarn. Yunhan remarked that the land was undoubtedly tainted by dark magic. However, Anzia remained undaunted and ventured. Human bones littered the surroundings, swirling black whirlwinds danced in the air, and noxious fungi sprouted from the ground. They had to tread carefully. The dense darkness unsettled Yunhan greatly. Suddenly, near the palace, Anzia noticed a stone tablet. It bore resemblance to the one found in the lake and also displayed ancient inscriptions. Anzia read aloud. It was a message from Rakshul, the last emperor of Jelkin. He cursed Philip and all those who raised their hands against the Jelkin Empire. Yet the text conveyed Rakshul's malevolence and foolishness, mentioning Philip only once. Anzia deduced that the message was not penned by Rakshul himself, but rather by Philip. As Anzia touched the tablet, her pendant illuminated, her vision blurred, and a scene unfolded before her eyes. A blazing palace, a woman interrogating Philip about how he could create such a tablet, questioning his humanity. In response, Philip asserted his status as emperor and refused to tolerate such disrespect. Yunhan's voice broke through Anzia's vision. He proposed leaving, but Anzia yearned to discover more clues. It was then that they witnessed immense clusters of dark and malevolent energy, resembling gigantic one-eyed creatures suspended in the sky. These were demonic monsters. Yunhin immediately scooped the princess into his arms and raced towards the palace with the demons in hot pursuit. He swiftly entered the palace and dashed through a narrow corridor, the relentless demons still chasing after them. A bit further, the corridor became blocked by a heap of stones. It was a dead end. Then Yundan gently placed Anzia on her feet, drew his sword, and prepared for battle. However, the demons flew past them and darted into narrow crevices between the stones of the blockade. Within seconds, they cleared the obstruction from the inside. Without touching Anzia and Yundan, they glided along the passage. Anzia realized that the demons were not attacking, but rather guiding them. They needed to follow them. The corridor led them to a staircase descending into the basement. Cautious as ever, Yunnan once again suggested turning back. Yet, Anzia resolved to press on until the end. They descended the stairs, reaching a vast chamber below. The demons flew nearby, illuminating their path. Finally, they arrived at a colossal golden door. It was secured with a magical lock. Yunhan explained that the lock could only be opened by either breaking the seal or discovering the correct password. However, it was an intricate seal, and cracking it would prove challenging. Anzia refused to surrender. She began searching everywhere for clues to the password. As she touched the door, it unexpectedly swung open. The seal upon it had vanished. They stepped through the door and were greeted by a resplendent hall, brimming with gold and precious gems. Yet amidst the opulence, stone slabs adorned with inscriptions also stood. Upon them lay a detailed chronicle of the imperial family. Anzia began to read. On one of the slabs, it was written that Rakshul had become the heir apparent, and on another, it was recorded that the heir had been betrothed to Rontel Belasian. She was the progenitor of their lineage, a light mage who had vanquished Jelkin alongside Philip. In other words, Rontel had been a princess of Jelkin herself, having destroyed it and founded another empire. It was perplexing. Anzia continued reading. Other stones listed the deaths of princesses. All of them succumbed to a dreadful malady that disfigured their faces and bodies. Anzia realized it referred to the plague. Princes and princesses perished incessantly over several years. On the next slab, it was inscribed about the death of the heir apparent. Thus, Rakshul had passed away even before the downfall of the Jelkin Empire. In the same year, the emperor also met his demise. And so, the emperor and the prince were dead. 
The Jelkin Empire fell on its own accord. Philip and Rontel did not destroy it. The entire history of the new empire was a myth. Philip emerged after their deaths. He healed the plague with light magic, and everyone began to worship him. Thus, Philip became the emperor. However, he also served as the successor to the Jelkin Emperor. Three years later, Philip married Rachel's intended bride, Rontel, and then he concocted the tale of Rachel's rebellion and the resurrection of Jelkin. Afterward, he placed the slabs recounting the Empire's history as if they were the work of Rachel, and he set the palace ablaze. Alas, nowhere was there a single mention of the curse, and suddenly, the protective amulet around Anzia's neck snapped and shattered into pieces. Yunhin immediately suggested they return. They clasped hands and made their way back to the palace. The emperor welcomed them. Anzia, tearful, rushed into his embrace. She had found nothing. She felt ashamed. The emperor consoled her, and just then, Colin burst into the room, announcing that Sir Blake had lost consciousness. Three days had elapsed, and the prince remained unconscious. His temperature had risen. Anzi sat by his bedside, blaming herself. She should have left immediately. After all, only Diana could aid him. She had promised to depart only once Blake regained consciousness. And just then, Blake regained consciousness and implored her not to leave. Anzia pledged not to depart. Soon, the prince slipped back into slumber. The following day, the emperor himself arrived at Blake's palace. He entered the prince's chambers without a knock. Immediately, he knelt beside the bed and caressed Blake's face. Anzia conveyed the significance of his support and once again cautioned the emperor against resorting to dark magic. Meanwhile, in Richard's estate, a servant engaged in conversation with his master. He recounted the prince's condition. Richard pondered deeply. The emperor would seek a new successor. Whom would he choose? The Duke of Castle, perhaps, but he is foolish and self-centered. No, the Emperor would not appoint him as the heir. Therefore, the Emperor must be eliminated. The Duke of Castle should be seated on the throne. Only then would Richard become the rightful heir, and in the future, the Emperor. Richard commanded his servant to inform the Emperor about a dark mage from an ancient lineage. Supposedly, this mage had the ability to transfer the prince's curse onto someone else. The emperor must fall for this deception, and Richard would kill him. However, after several days, the servant returned with news. The emperor had shown no reaction to this rumor. Richard was dismayed. He pondered further and devised a new plan. He must become Anzia's husband. The emperor held great affection for her. If she were to love him in return, the throne would practically be within his grasp. Richard began contemplating a lavish gift that Anzia would surely not refuse. Ten days had passed. Anzia, Tenson, and the doctor stood by Blake's bedside. The doctor announced that if the prince did not regain consciousness by tomorrow, there was a high likelihood of his demise. Anzia once again started blaming herself. However, the emperor declared that the blame for the curse lay with the imperial lineage. If Blake were to die, Anzia would become the heir to the throne. The emperor would simply abdicate in her favor. Then the descendants of Philip would cease to rule, and the curse would no longer exist. Yet Anzia refused to entertain the idea. She threw herself onto the bed, enfolding the prince in her embrace, sobbing. And in that moment, Blake opened his eyes and called out to her. He was bewildered. Anzia burst into tears from an overflow of emotions. Blake was delighted to see her. At that moment, Tenson addressed him. They hadn't seen each other in three years, but now his father showed sympathy towards Blake. The long-awaited reunion between father and son had taken place. Anzia was about to leave them alone and fetch the doctor. However, the emperor anticipated her and swiftly departed. Anzia and Blake surrendered to their emotions. Blake expressed that he felt better because Anzia was by his side. Since then, the emperor visited Blake's palace every three days. Sometimes they dined together. Yet Blake enjoyed spending time with Anzia the most, and she, in turn, felt her love for him growing stronger. For a long time, she tried to distance herself from Blake, believing that she should step aside and make way for Diana. But the further she went, the less she wanted to leave. After the prince's prolonged illness, she realized she didn't want to lose him. 
Once, Anzia referred to him as Your Highness. However, now that their feelings had become so intense, she started calling him by his name, Anzia. Blake said, Blake, Anzia replied, and they embraced